This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. Well, it's our drinking water, our recreational water, but it's also the site of the second most contaminated coal ash plant in the country. I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around, we'll tell you more coming up. We'll also show you how teens from Charlotte's Bloomy Awards measure up on the national stage. And we'll show you how a young Charlotte artist uses skills she learned from her grandfather to revive these old painted ghost signs. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. The Charlotte area is number two on another national top 10 list, but this time it's not a good thing. An environmental group says one of our local power plants on the Catawba River is the second most contaminated coal ash site in the country. And now North Carolina officials are ordering a cleanup. As part of our Planet Carolina report, Carolina Impact's Jeff Saunier joins us from Lake Wiley with more on why all that contaminated coal ash is there in the first place. Some big fish come out of this lake. Yes, sir, they do. John mccaston has been catching the big ones in these waters for a long time, and he's got the pictures to prove it. Probably eight or nine years old, and I'm 67 now. And Duke Energy's Allen Steam Plant, well, it's been here on Lake Wiley even longer. If you pay attention to all the boats that leave here going fishing, most of them head straight up to Allen's discharge to catch the large catfish, the large bass, the crappie, the white perch. That's their go-to destination, the discharge coming out of Allen's steam plant. So that water better be clean. It is clean, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you wouldn't have the large numbers of fish and wildlife on this lake if it wasn't. But what the fishermen can't see from the water near Plant Allen, or from the front gate, or from this dead-end dirt road behind the plant, are the acres of coal ash sitting underwater at the bottom of giant ponds. This stuff is in the most dangerous place possible. It's a problem. It needs to go somewhere else. Sam Perkins is the former Catawba River Keeper who fought for years to safely remove the toxic coal ash from Plant Allen on Lake Wiley and from a second Duke Energy plant further north on Lake Norman. The last place you want it is propped up 80 feet high on the banks of your drinking water reservoir. But Duke Energy says their plan to drain the ponds and cap the coal ash right where it is, well, that's safe too. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency determined after extensive analysis that both capping and excavation are safe. So if either method works, why would you put neighbors through billions more in costs and decades longer in disruption for no measurable scientific benefit? When it comes to coal ash near the Catawba, Duke Energy and its detractors don't agree on much, but there is at least one thing they do agree on, that neither side wants a repeat here on the Catawba River of what happened on the Dan River five years ago, where Duke Energy had the third biggest coal ash spill in U.S. history, leading to these protests outside Duke Energy headquarters here in Charlotte. Dan River was a catalytic event for the company, and it forced us to re-examine how we are closing all the bases. We had a pipe there uh, collapse, and millions of gallons of water went out that pipe. With the basins that we're closing now, we've either already removed all that water or we're in the process of safely removing it now. Since then, Duke has closed 22 coal ash basins at its power plants, including the old Riverbend station on Mountain Island Lake. Two stacks down, four stacks down, half the powerhouse down, it's gone. <laughs> These sites that we have here around the Charlotte region are much larger, much more visual, and would have much more of an impact than the Dan River spill had on the Dan River downstream. Now North Carolina is ordering coal ash removed from all Duke Power stations, including the Allen and Marshall plants here on the Catawba River. <laughs> Until recently, they were planning to leave all of the ash where it is. And uh, we, I think we said as much in the report, we thought that was a bad idea. Abel Ross is the researcher who studied groundwater testing results here at Plant Allen and every other coal power plant in the country. And we were just checking to see whether the groundwater at each coal plant uh, was unsafe, whether it had unsafe levels of coal ash pollutants. 
We're talking with him via Skype from his office in Vermont. And your ranking has uh, the Allen plant number two. Does that mean it's the second worst contamination site in the country? According to our ranking system, yes. It was number two, meaning that it exceeded drinking water standards by the largest margin for the largest number of pollutants. Wow. With the exception of one other plant. Cobalt was over 500 times above drinking water standards. Other pollutants that were also elevated included arsenic, which was six times higher than drinking water standards, beryllium, six times higher than drinking water standards, lithium, 12 times higher than drinking water standards, and a few others. But Duke says those pollutants are confined only to the groundwater under Plant Allen's own property, and that separate testing at Lake Wiley shows no coal ash pollution in the drinking water. To be very clear, no one's drinking water supplies are affected by our basins. Recreational water supplies are still safe from our operations. Duke Energy, meanwhile, says Plant Allen and other coal ash sites are what the EPA calls low risk, and that Duke will support solutions that protect customers and the environment. And John McCaston thinks fishing here in Lake Wiley is actually better than it used to be. A lot cleaner. Really? A lot cleaner. When I, when I was a kid, all the cities put their sewage in the, directly into the lake. Now say river watchers if they can just get rid of the coal ash too. The coal ash needs to get away from the banks of the Catawba River and it needs to go somewhere. Our commitment, regardless of how we end up ultimately closing these basins, is to keep our neighbors safe, is to keep the lakes safe. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Sonia reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. We've got a link to the National Coal Ash Study on our website at pbscharlotte.org, then click on our Carolina Impact page. Well, you know the phrase need for speed? Whether it's from racing, the movies, or video games, I think we all want to go fast sometimes in our lives. But one Charlotte nonprofit has flipped around the words, creating something with a whole new meaning. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis tells us more. Hey, Mavericks. Yeah. About ice. Tom Cruise one. and Val Kilmer uttered really? the line in the classic 80s movie Top Gun. I feel the need, the need for speed. Ow! A Charlotte nonprofit flipped around those famous words, creating something with an entirely new meaning. Speed for need. It isn't meant to just be a play on words. Speed for Need's purpose is to give a little joy to those who may not otherwise have it. Our mission is to foster inclusion and raise awareness of, of various special needs through participation in these athletic events. The idea? Give those with disabilities a chance to participate in area running events by being escorted in customized racing wheelchairs. Almost there! Well, we just thought it was a great idea to, to be able to come out and give people that have disabilities, any special need, just to have a reason to want to get to the finish line. I have a son who's on the autism spectrum, and the opportunity to, to help people uh, participate in athletic events who otherwise would not be able to participate uh, really spoke to me. Speed for Need formed less than two years ago by the local men's workout group F3, which stands for Fitness, Fellowship, and Faith. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if our exercise group could leverage what we do and we passionately love, which is fitness, and we'd leverage that into serving. Since F3 members were already regulars at area races, they thought it would be a cool idea to help those fighting cancer or living with other disabilities to actually get involved in the events instead of just sitting on the sidelines. It's hard when you're a survivor because you don't like to draw attention to yourself so you know it's hard to feel like you blend in but somehow speed for me makes that so easy for people those individuals have been in dealing with the doctors and getting the shots and getting the x-rays and just day-to-day -day life isn't normal like for myself where I could finish that race and I go back to work the next day I go home to my family my kids some of these are going straight back to the hospitals our real heroes today are Dick and Rick Hoyt better known as team Hoyt inspired by team Hoyt the father-son combo in Boston that began using this type of chair in the 1970s, Speed for Need has participated in 50-plus events, pushing some 200 riders across the finish line throughout Charlotte and the surrounding region. I'm the one that uh, takes these chairs all over the all over the place, Virginia, Kentucky, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. There's a team of four of us on the logistics side of the house. The events that we, we participate in, uh, it may be for breast cancer, it may be for autism, it may be for, for muscular dystrophy. Uh, I would say we're a, we're a conduit or we amplify somebody else's cause. It was revolutionary for, for our race and we, we literally can't do without them now. We, we just, we love them and we're so indebted to them. Nobody would have guessed, myself or anybody in our wildest dreams, that we would have 
had that much reception for what we're doing. Speed for Need recently participated in the annual Sarcoma Stomp, where one of their riders, or track commanders as they call them, was 14-year-old London Secor. I thought it was really cool at first, and I still do, because I didn't know anything like this existed. Um, but when I did, it felt really nice that someone would be willing to do this. Four years ago, London was diagnosed with sarcoma, a cancerous tumor that affects connective tissue. She beat it with chemo and radiation, but just six months later, the cancer was back, this time wrapping around her pelvic bone. She went to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, undergoing three rounds of surgeries. The operation saved her life, but left her with limited movement in her feet. I lost my ability to run, and for a while, my ability to walk. However, I'm here and I'm alive. I don't think about myself as a victim. I see myself as a person that's just happy to be here today. London's prognosis is good. She just completed her second sarcoma stomp, riding with speed for need, traveling right alongside her mother. And I thought that would be a great way for her to be able to participate and be a part of the team. And she can be right beside me. I was kind of iffy at first because I was afraid of making people run for me, but then when I did it, it felt free, it felt fun. They do such a beautiful job at making London so comfortable when she gets in that chair that she is just like everybody else. And she is there with her team and she is loved and she is supported, not by just her family and her friends, but also by Speed for Need and all the F3 brothers. That's Speed for Need. Their motto is who pushes who. Is it the drivers literally pushing the riders in a road race, or is it the riders pushing the drivers as volunteer servants? We do it because we want to, we enjoy it, uh, we get a lot out of it. We just do it for a love of wanting to serve in the community. Nobody on our board gets paid, nobody gets paid really. This is just service with a smile, we're just happy to do it. It's a fire that lights in you. Anybody that I know that's actually been behind one of these chairs and got to know the track commander and hugged them at the end, they come back. I mean, it gives you goosebumps to talk about it. They come back. Before now, you likely hadn't heard of Speed for Need, but these guys are here, a group of men doing good for the community. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks so much, Jason. When Speed for Need launched two years ago, it started with just two wheelchairs. The organization now has nine that carry a cost of about $4,000 each. When we think of musical theater, we often think Broadway in New York City. But did you know Charlotte's getting quite the reputation for our very talented musical theater students? The Blumenthal Performing Arts Center created the regional Bloomy Awards eight years ago. Students from 48 high schools across 10 counties compete. The Best Actor and Actress winners go on to compete nationally in New York City at the Jimmy Awards. Carolina Impact's Suzette Reed tells us more. Awards Night captivates everyone in a fantastic display of talent and energy. Almost 50 high schools participate, at least two students from each school. The best of the best are here having the time of their lives. And the Bloomy Award goes to... Each year there's a Best Actor and Best Actress. They go on to compete nationally in New York at the Jimmy Awards. And over the eight years of the Bloomies, Charlotte students do very well in New York. Well, the most common is what's in the water down there. <laughs> Joking aside, our teens have proven themselves on High School Musical's biggest stage. When they say they're from Charlotte, these kids in the Jimmy Awards take notice because Charlotte's record is quite remarkable. In this place, I feel at ease. Here are some of the highlights. Renee Rapp from Charlotte won Best Actress at the Bloomies last year. Renee Rapp. Yes. Then won that category at the Jimmys. Amina Fay. Yes. Amina Fay won the Best Actress at the Bloomies in 2016. New world. Then won the Jimmys. Yes. Anna Hertel won Best Actress at the Bloomies in 2017 and won Best Dancer at the Jimmy. There are also a whole host of Bloomies Award talent who are on Broadway or are in professional theater companies across the country. 
And of course, there's Eva Noblezada, 2013 Bloomy winner. She was discovered at the Jimmys that year and cast in Miss Saigon in London. She continued Miss Saigon on Broadway and was nominated for a Tony Award. She was just nominated again for a second Tony Award, this time for her performance in Broadway's Hadestown. Tom Gabbard, president and CEO of the Blumenthal Charlotte, Performing Arts Center, created and launched the Bloomy Awards eight years ago. The nationally recognized theater insider knew how he wanted to support our region's students. The students who audition for Best Actor, Best Actress, they are invited to a day-long audition workshop before they actually do their official audition. The coaches work with them on repertoire selection, how to stand, how to sing a phrase, uh, and they have a day of coaching. No other city does that. And that kind of intentional and attention to detail support is important to our students when they enter the national spotlight for high school musical theater. Jay Everett was the first to support the Bloomy Awards. When you actually look at the student experience that they have by being engaged with this program, it's pretty amazing. The Wells Fargo Foundation has been supporting the Bloomy Awards for the last eight years, and we're really proud of the fact that we've been able to invest in a program that's only grown over that period of time. And Everett has seen the Charlotte teens compete at the Jimmys. While these students are in New York, they have a really great experience with um, talent scouts, with Broadway professionals, with um, musical um, experts, with teaching experts. And so it's both a development opportunity and it's a competition. And these students really bring it when they get to the national level. And it's always impressive to see that program. Eight years ago, Bloomy Awards didn't even exist. The high school musical theater world in our region was not interconnected. There was no clear pathway to the national stage. Today, the Bloomy Awards sell out its more than 2,000 seats in a matter of hours. The night celebrates months of work and years of effort by so many people. And all that takes center stage. And this spotlight shines brightly well beyond our region. Suzette joins me in the studio now, and I'm just all excited for Eva Noblezada with her second Tony nomination, and she's not even 25 yet. Her story is remarkable. First, she was nominated for the first Tony. She was next to Bit Bette Midler, right? That was the most incredible thing. And now she's nominated for a second Tony, and you're right, I, I think she's 23? And there are other options. For our young folks, it's not just about the students performing so well, it often takes teachers to help get them there. And it's such a great thing to be able to see the recognition coming to that theater teacher at Northwest School of the Arts. Yeah, Matt Hinson, he is remarkable. He is the first person that Renee Rapp, who won Best Actress at the Bloomy Awards last year, I remember she thanked him first. And he is a remarkable teacher who is by the piano, individually working with the different students and we, ha we hear that he's remarkable so no one is surprised that he is uh, deemed inspirational um, teacher on a national level. So best actor, best actress go off to the Jimmy Awards nationally but there's something for other folks here in the summertime for those theater kids who love it. What can they take part in? Well, they, there's a summer intensive called Broadway Dreams for those high school kids. And you're right, outside of Best Actor and Best Actress, there's a whole you know group of other kids that want to participate talented. and very talented. So Broadway Dreams is a summer intensive. New York professionals come and they get to participate in this intense, massive effort to really learn from professionals. And I, I understand that that program has really helped so many young people. So, but those are for high school kids. Is there anything for our younger, younger wannabe theater folks? Absolutely. There is a program called Broadway Junior, and that is for elementary and middle school students where they take big mega productions, condense it into a 30 minute program that elementary and middle schools could take on and have it be guided and presented and formatted in a way that's doable. And I understand that that gives that, the, it's planting the seed, right, for those early young people, um, at, at, you know, at elementary and middle school era. So, great information, great young people doing great things in our community. Thanks so much, Suzette. Absolutely. You can watch the Bloomy Awards only on PBS Charlotte. It premieres Tuesday, May 28th at 8 o'clock.
Well, before social media, before the internet, even before television and radio, hand-painted signs and murals on brick walls were how businesses promoted their products. You've seen them, right? The smiling face on the side of an old building inviting you to sip a sun drop or drive Dodge. They weren't just ads, they were art. They were meant to last. And today, many of these so-called ghost signs still survive here in the Carolinas. PBS Charlotte's videographer Doug Stacker and reporter Jeff Saunier introduce us to a young Charlotte artist who's preserving these old ghost signs along with the memories of what she learned about them from her grandfather. They're the fading brick wall pages in the scrapbook of every small town. The painted on words and pictures that take us back to what it used to look like, what it used to be like. This one comes and this one goes. And when these walls whisper their long forgotten messages, Amber Thompson is listening. She's the artist who brings those messages back to life. In whispers, in whispers, you say. No one I know knows how to do this. So that's Amber kind of learned the lost art started. of restoring and repainting ghost signs from her late grandfather, who did the same work on these historic Coca-Cola murals his entire career. He saw that like I was interested and that I was capable of doing it. Like he was pretty invested in like teaching me. So that was really, you know, special to me because that's something he had done his whole life that he was passing on. So our stories and pictures, oh, we let them go, let them go home. And he never called himself an artist. He was like, I'm just a sign painter, I'm not an artist. I felt like it's an art form. Here in Statesville, Amber's putting new paint on an old ghost sign that's been here for decades. I see it's going on quicker than we thought. And the sign design coming from this Bible of Coca-Cola murals that her grandfather handed down. The red was eight feet with a one foot border all the way around and then two feet of welcome to historic Statesville underneath. And it's 23 feet long and 10 feet tall. It's hard to do. Sometimes the older brick has deeper grooves in it or whatnot. But my grandfather would tell me too, he's like, you gotta look at the wall and see like how hard it is to paint on it. You could see the Coca-Cola, but I wasn't just tracing what was already there. I had to start completely over. And so you can see the brick underneath where the original was painted. They weren't painted as art, but they have become art. Yes, they, they have, because it's a, di it's a skill that's no longer here, because now, you know. Andy Poor is the historian for the town of Mooresville, which has its own collection of ghost signs they're trying to preserve. The freshly painted ones still catch your eye at busy downtown intersections, just like the now faded murals did decades ago. I have seen your beauty grow. They were meant to pop off and grab a person and engage you in into whatever they were advertising, whatever they were they were selling. In whispers, in whispers. This has become an art form because, and, and people don't realize that these guys and gals who did this were artists. These were done by professionals, uh, and they were they were high quality. They were done to to last, and so they have they they have morphed now into a a part of our Amer Americana that is now part of our collective memory because you don't do it anymore. It's more like a landmark thing, I think, for a lot of these like small town areas. All time we I just think they're cool, you know. I, li I like them old like that. Um, I feel like the brand new look doesn't really fit. Our stories and the downtown vibe to me. Like, I feel like it needs a few years of age on it before it looks like it belongs there. I would say half the people that I talk to about the sign 
half of them had seen it and the other half hadn't. But the Coke was pretty visible. That's why this was the easy one in town to pick because it was, you could see it. I mean, you really could see it. Why anyone would paint over it is beyond me, but uh, it's back. It is back. I thought about my grandfather a lot the day I was painting by myself. Guessing, you're like, I don't know if this is how it's supposed to be done, and I don't have anybody to ask. This is something really cool that I want to keep doing that somehow dropped into my laps. I thought about him a lot and like just the times that we spent. I don't know if he recognized how cool it was. I hope he did. Such a beautiful story. Our videographer spent several weeks in Statesville alongside artist Amber Thompson capturing those brush strokes that will keep that old ghost sign alive. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for this evening. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time. And we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.